like we're expecting a sea change in American policy vis-a-vis -vis other countries. And we wanted and we expected Obama to reverse the unilateralism and exceptionalism of the many years of the previous administration. As we search for the major guideposts of the Obama administration, these are the themes I gathered. President Obama's pivotal declaration about the role of the U.S. with the rest of the world is quite potent, and I quote, the United States security emanates from the justice of its cause, the force of its example, the tempering qualities of humility and restraint. As the world grows smaller, our common humanity shall reveal itself, and as America plays the role of ushering a new year of peace, it must seek a new way forward with the Muslim world guided only by mutual respect and mutual interests. Would that those beautifully crafted words find flesh in the way the United States conducts itself around the world as it continues to shape and to mold its environment so it will be more hospitable and less hostile to the way of life that it is selling to the world. But what is the situation on the ground? I look at the picture of arms expenditure around the world. The amount of money devoted by countries to the purchase of arms alone tops a trillion dollars. These arms sales consist of guns, ammunition, missiles, military aircraft, military vehicles, ships, and others. Ironically, as the leader of the United States articulates a policy of peace and mutuality of interest, it is also at the top of the list of those who sell arms to the rest of the world, followed only by Russia, Great Britain, Germany, China, and France. Indeed, it's the height of supreme irony that the very same countries, the G5, the G8, the G20s, who are meeting constantly to seek answers to the continuing countries around the world, are also fueling such conflicts with their continuing arms sales. In the forthcoming December conference in, on Afghanistan that the G20 is contemplating, one doubts very much whether the issue of arms sales will be discussed at all. Where is the military in all this? Last week, the commander of the combined joint U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan, Lieutenant General Stan McChrystal, submitted a report to President Obama where he advised a change in strategy in Afghanistan, centering on weaning the hearts and minds of the Afghans and limiting airstrikes which result in thousands of civilian casualties. The increasing number of U.S. soldiers killed there, 182 soldiers since the start of the year, has also made any move to increase the U.S. forces rather untenable with diminishing support from the American public. As the United States continues to be challenged by the recession, its citizenry is also continuing to ask the question whether the increasing expenditure related to the ne seemingly never-ending counter-terrorism campaigns in Afghanistan will never end. Are the billions of dollars required to sustain these operations better expended for making the lives of the citizens better? Is the United States willing to give the comforts of life or the high quality of life which it wants every American to have to the rest of the world? Is this a cheap sea change that we are expecting? And should the military be at the forefront and the chief implementer of U.S. foreign policy? I believe it's time for the rethinking of our assumptions about interstate relations. I think it is also time for a rethinking of the role that the United States performs as the country with the greatest military prowess. Some analysts have zeroed in on the declining power of the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis the rising of China. But I think the more relevant question to ask is how the United States shall use to advantage its military primacy by making it possible for an environment of cooperation and collaboration 
to be the backbone of the relationship among states. Since the era of expansionism and acquisition of territories has long passed, the leaders of the world are now beginning to realize that the territory as configured in the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 looms less and less in the calculation of what matters to the individual. After all, the individual is still the singular measure of state interest. If this were the case, then the efforts of the state should be a search for a regional or international platform that will govern interstate relations, that will govern overlaps of jurisdiction and will provide for avenues for settling disputes and enforcement action on the collective level. If there is any theme that should undergird the policies of, of the major actors in international politics, it is really the goal of rendering war obsolescent. This means that the military should no longer be the implementer of U.S. foreign policy. It also means that the military is the only legitimate authority to use force shall be engaged in operations other than war and shall be the lead actor because of its capabilities in ensuring a better quality of life to all peoples of the world regardless of race or nationality is this a utopian view of the world <laughs> far from it war can be rendered obsolescent as we find more and more means towards cooperative and collaborative undertakings among, uh, amongst us. <coughs> as the world globalizes and as the economies of states get enmeshed in one web, labor, capital, information, travel as fast as technology can allow, states are discovering that the usual territorial limits of state actions no longer coincide with the activities of the citizenry as they transcend the geographic limits of the nation state. The systems of production, distribution, and exchange of goods are now cosmopolitanized and no longer <coughs> national. The erstwhile national boundaries have diminished in salience as communication technology created global villages. Civil societies have now linked with like-minded groups. In other countries, an international civil society has started to emerge. The challenges of security no longer can be met by the usual resort to the use of force. As I have noted er earlier, the military can no longer be the chief implementer of policy. We discover that the new economic interdependence among states reduces the incentive to use force and subsequently raises the cost of the use of force. The challenges of human security are coming from environmental degra degradation, many more from the effects of climate change. It is not surprising that in the many recorded failed states, the failure of the state to provide the fundamental needs of its citizenry comes from the degradation of their environment, the decimation of their forests, the desertification of their grasslands, and the epidemics of diseases that ravage their burgeoning population. Of course, we all know that the failure of all this also comes from the failure to govern well and to govern with accountability.